My name is Courtney Colson, a female to male to female detransitioner, and on this channel we try to figure out what the hell is wrong with me. This episode will complete the trilogy of what the hell is wrong with me. The first episode was about autoandrophilia, the second one was about metabolism, and this one is about emotional intensity. And if you're a long-time viewer of this channel, you think, oh, that's kind of ironic, because wasn't there an episode called Emotional Analgesia, where I did not experience emotional pain at all? Or, I was starting to experience emotions for the first time. And that video was three years old. It's three years old now. It only has 7,000 views. My first video has, I don't know, 40, 50,000 views. The algorithm's weird. And I've been through a lot of shit since then. I think, well, especially the last three, no, last two years, I have just been going through hell. Life has been kicking my ass repeatedly, breaking my heart again and again and again. And I do get some nasty comments here and there where people say, oh, you, you got to stop playing the victim and you, you uh, complain too much. And no, no, I think anyone who has gone through what I have gone through, would be pretty worn out. Even if they had a whole lifetime to develop emotional regulation and experience. I was experiencing emotions for the first time. And I experienced some of the worst, most traumatic things anyone could experience. You know, I don't think, oh, my life is worse than anyone else's, or I'm a victim. No, it's just a fact. Lots of things have happened. The last two years, most of my life was pretty safe, repetitive, tame, uh, mundane. And I think the lack of emotions, it wasn't making me blind to horrible things that were happening. I had a fairly safe, normal childhood and... and adolescence. But when you start developing emotions, you have desires, you have ambitions. So that means you have to go out into the world and take risks. I mean, some of the things that happened to me were nothing to do with that, but others were. But yeah, well, we'll get into all of that. And before anyone has a go at me for wearing an eye patch, no, it's not for fun. No, I'm not autistic. I do need my eye patch. I was fine until I start. I pressed record. My name is Courtney. Co ah, fuck, my eyes closed. So, I know, I guess, especially when I'm stressed or I'm very self aware of my face as I'm filming a video, that might trigger the ptosis, as the condition is called. Uh, it hasn't healed, and doctors are saying I might need surgery for it, which, eh, not sure if I want to do that. Uh, I have some trust issues, and I don't really want to go into general anesthesia, so the eye patch is here to say, I'm Big Boss. I like being Big Boss. Before we get into the video, what is emotional intensity? So everything I mentioned before, autoantrophilia and metabolic issues, those are real categorized psychological and, and medical conditions. Emotional intensity isn't really a defined thing. It's a concept that comes up in, in psychology here and there. But I guess you could say it's more of a, a characteristic, a personality type, whatever. And I think I always had that emotional intensity even before I had emotions. So even though I, I could never really be upset, people who are emotionally intense, they think about things deeply. They, they are prone to existential angst. They have huge imaginations. They have a rich inner world. And they take things very deeply, very seriously whether that's fiction, movies, stories, you know, those stories come to life for them in a way that their surprise doesn't apply to other people. Most people just read a book or watch a movie and it's just something to kill time, whereas for other people, they become so absorbed in it and they reflect deeply on, on those characters and the meaning of all of it. And, you know, I've always been like that. 
And there is some suggestion that this emotional intensity is kind of a neurodiversity. I don't know about any of that. We'll talk about my opinions on the whole concept of neurodiversity. But yeah, I just think some people are more sensitive. They're deeper. They think more deeply about things. They have a stronger reaction to things. They're not surface level. And so when I was reading articles about it, it's like, wow, no, that is me. That describes me a lot and why I felt that I, I didn't really fit in anywhere and why I didn't relate to other people. And now that I do have emotions, the cruel irony is that I feel a lot and I feel deeply. And I thought, okay, now I understand what other people go through. I can relate to other people. And now I feel that I experience too many emotions from my perspective now it's as if other people don't feel anything they don't seem to care am i the only one who cares it's it's a strange position to find oneself in being on the total opposite end of the emotional spectrum that being said let's look back three years ago and see how i felt back then First thing that stands out to me is that I had an action figure on display, it was an Optimus Prime, and yeah, I was still a little bit autistic, a little bit geeky back then. My hair was growing out. I don't think it looks bad, but yeah, I, I like my mullet now. I'm very happy with the mullet. I think this is the look I'm sticking with. I did base it on Big Boss. I, I cut it. I look at the photos of, of Big Boss and I cut my hair. To, to resemble it as much as possible. Cut my own hair, by the way, because I, I got a hairdresser to do it, and they fucked it up. It's only just grown to a length I'm happy with. But, uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's curly, not straight, but I think it looks good curly. So. That's neither here nor there. Focusing. Uh, I haven't changed too much in terms of my style. I don't have any other clothes anymore. But, yeah, okay. I kind of miss that bedspread, the triangle one. I think I just got rid of it because I had too many memories. Just had to move on, get something new. Almost a year ago to this day. Didn't have my intro yet. This is my second video that I ever did. So, you know, I don't know when it first shows up. Probably the third or fourth video. We'll see. I bought a Flemish giant, which is the second largest breed of rabbit in the world, in case you're curious. So we open with me telling a story about my pet rabbit Baxter and how he died. Then I cut to this clip of Star Trek where Spock says... Uh, Spock says that caring and feeling are not the same thing. And when I heard that, that was such a revelation for me because I went, Yes! That's what it's like for me. I don't think I'll ever know what love feels like, but I definitely know... I know what love feels like. I have since fallen in love. And it's awful. I never thought I would love anyone. And I fell in love with someone, and it, you know when you're in love, because it doesn't feel like anything else, and it's, it's intense, and you want to spend the rest of your life with that person, you feel absolutely comfortable in every way with them, with their body, with everything, and I never thought that would happen, and it just... Yeah, it just happens so naturally, and so you're filled with these feelings of, okay, yeah, I can, I can share my life with this person. But I, unfortunately, had to fall in love with someone who did not reciprocate at all. Yeah, it's, it's just been an incredibly difficult thing to go through, and just, <laughs> of course, typical of me that I, I've gone through a lot of things, and emotions have just been awful. The entire experience of emotions has been awful. And then finally have this nice, warm, beautiful emotion, love. And that becomes torment as well. Yeah, you know, I couldn't just fall in love with someone and they feel the same way. And it was just easy and natural and straightforward. And I got to have that experience that killed the loneliness, at least temporarily. And I could have those normal adult experiences. You know, I'm about to th turn 32 in a few days. This is the last day of 2023. 
My birthday is the 2nd of January, and yeah. I haven't experienced anything. I've never been on a second date. I think I've been kissed twice, and only by men. And yeah, I just, I crave contact, love, real connection. And I just don't get it. I, I look for it, I try everything, and it, it always ends up backfiring. So, given that this person did not reciprocate, I went out onto the dating apps, of, as I've mentioned in other videos, and that was a disaster. A whole long story there, but just a lot of fraudsters, catfishers liars, people just wouldn't show up, or I thought we had a really good first date, and then they would block me, or unmatch, or whatever you call it. It was a lot of different apps, but yeah, they would unmatch from me, and I am i haven't been diagnosed, but I'm quite sure that I'm dealing with PTSD from, from the accident, and so I, I can't deal with this sort of rejection anymore. I think I have good self-esteem, but just the way I, I'm being rejected constantly, you know, <laughs> my mother especially, put this idea in my head that, oh, I am very desirable, and I'd have no problem finding a partner, and whenever, every time my mother and I went out shopping, oh, the men are looking at me, are they? I don't notice, I mean, she, she would always notice that I would, I would catch the eye of men, but now I'm actually out in the dating world, and I feel repulsive. I, I apparently, no one likes me, no one wants to be with me, so, yeah, it's, it's awful. It has just been terrible, and I, I, I envy who I was back then. Life was a lot easier that I, I wasn't being killed with this loneliness just a little bit every day it gets a little harder every day to live with this anyway getting back to the video uh, duty loyalty devotion if anything i would say that my version of love is far more unconditional and logical than someone with emotion where they, just, they might feel like, mm, I don't love you anymore. Maybe I want to be with someone else. I'm not going to do that. So, that is true. That And I, that, I think that ties into emotional intensity as well. That having that intensity where you live by a moral code and you uphold those values and you take that very seriously... Most people don't really do that. They're just more, I don't know, improvisational. And so, I mean, to this day, I have mentioned in other videos the uh, the strength, integrity, truth, tenets that I live by, codes that I live by. And when I fail to uphold those principles, I, I do feel bad. I do feel that I've let myself down. You know, I, I'm not religious. I don't subscribe to any kind of ideology like that, I have my own philosophy, I have my own standards, and I try my best already to live up to those standards. And, well, the emotions make that harder, especially strength. Uh, my confidence has taken a beating, and yeah, I've made myself pathetic and vulnerable amongst the people that I wanted love from. So... Yeah, on that I can relate, although I guess our uh, application of our moral codes are a bit different. I've uh, removed the eye patch now. I think my eye is going to be okay, hopefully for the rest of the video. I, I don't know. We shall see. Look, I put makeup on. I don't normally wear makeup, so I, I want to make the most of it, okay? But uh, there was something past Courtney said about how... She never really leaves people. She, she wouldn't abandon someone. And that's that's very true. I'm still like that. Where a lot of people have left me over the years. I, I have lost a lot of friendships. My family no longer talks to me. Well, it's sort of. It's 
I don't know, we're, we're very distant, it's not what it used to be. And if those people wanted to come back into my life, I I would. I would just accept them. And, I mean, the relationship is probably never going to be the same as what it was. But, yeah, I, I never give up on people. And if there was some sort of life or death situation where I could save someone who is, who is now an enemy or considers me their enemy, no, I would still rescue them. I would still look after them no matter what. I don't abandon people the way other people in my life have. It's just not in me to do that. I'm a stoic by default, and I also really agree with this Buddhist philosophy of impermanence. And before I even knew those philosophies as a child, that's kind of what I was always leaning towards, but I just didn't have the language to articulate it. And I still read a lot of Stoic texts, I still refer to that as inspiration, motivation, and, 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 and the Buddhist philosophy as well. You know, life is suffering, life is impermanence. But it's a lot more challenging. You know, I turn to these philosophies to help me get through these challenges in a way that before I would read these things and go, yeah, right on, I grok with that, I just relate to that. But now it's more a case of reminding myself that, you know, I am not at the whim of my emotions or I shouldn't react this way or shouldn't react that way in certain situations. Uh, I have meditations by Marcus Aurelius by my bedside and I just open it to a random page and highlight a passage that I think I should meditate on, and that really helps. And because Aurelius was a very emotional man, he had anger management issues. And I, mean, I don't do with anger so much, but I, I think there is overlap in what he tells himself to deal with those feelings is applicable to me a thousand years later. And the concept of impermanence. My life didn't have a lot of permanence. Well, in some ways it did, some ways it didn't. We were always moving from house to house every couple of years because we were renting and one thing or another happened, so we would be kicked out. But I went to the same school the entire primary school years, same high school, all those years. And my family was together pretty much, oh, until my early 20s, then we all fractured. But the first 20 years of my life were, were pretty consistent and safe. And had the same, most of the same friends. I'm going to have to put that eye patch on. It's just, oh my god. But the concept of impermanence is painful for me now, in a way it never was before. But I just want things to slow down, and I want stability. You know, it's fine that, you know, I acknowledge that everything comes to an end, but could I just have those things even for a little while? Still, I don't have uh, any long-term residence. I mean, this is my... Well, thankfully, I'm staying with a friend, and she's giving me a sewing room as well as a bedroom. And... Well, she's been a friend of mine since university, so that's over a decade now. So I have that permanence, and this house uh, I've visited many times, so this is a familiar place to me, so at least I have that. But having to move out of my house recently that I loved, I loved that, despite all the burglaries and all the drama, I loved that place. I don't have anything to do with my family anymore. Uh, one of my grandparents has died. And, I, well, I hope nothing happens at my workplace. I hope I manage to stay in that job for a while. But, yeah, it's just breaking my heart to open myself up to things, allow myself to enjoy things, love where I live, love the people around me, and then they go. And you got to start all over again and build these things up. And it's hard. It really is. that Those things are not easy to replace. 
And these past few years, my heart is broken again and again and again. It's a feeling I know very well. Just, <laughs> it's it's shocking just the way I've been treated. It is, it's, it's, you go into this, this shock. I don't know what else to call it. You just can't believe these things are happening. Or that these people would treat you this way. You thought you trusted them. You thought you knew them. But <laughs> nothing's permanent. You know, how am I meant to heal? How am I meant to move on? When you're constantly moving on. There is no moving on from a trauma. And then you get to a nice stable place. Everything I read about PTSD, they talk about it. Uh, it's a lot of combat veterans. It's a lot of studies is, is focused on that. So you know they experience trauma in war. They come home, and then civilian life. They have trouble adapting, but this is a stable environment usually. So this is a place that they can just recover and and heal. But for me, it's never stopped. I was dealing even after being hit by a car, nearly dying, and, and recovering from all those injuries. I was dealing with abuse from my family. Uh, I was dealing with all sorts of other issues from coming at me from every other way. So I think my main issue now, as I mentioned in my last video, my, my metabolism, my metabolic health is 100%. But I'm just under constant stress, and no amount of meditation or CBD is going to fix that if you're in these horrible situations day in day out where people are betraying you abandoning you breaking your heart <laughs> what are you supposed to do feel nothing and that's the thing is so past me or, or connor didn't go through any of this that's that's the thing that blows my mind is it's not like I'm out here now attracting all these problems. I didn't go running into traffic. I didn't go picking fights. I didn't do anything. But I seem to be going through much more dramatic horror stories. Whereas, yeah, my life was pretty passive then. And, and I was passive in response. For a long time, I did think there was something wrong with me. I did worry I was maybe a psychopath. But no, I think I've got a very strong sense of morals, of right and wrong. I have a very strict code of behavior. So I guess when I started having dissociative episodes at the age of 23, I'm nearly 29 now, it's not surprising that the shape that took on was this delusion that I was an android robot or something like that not that kind of robot but you know more like a you know companion servant domestic android and that's actually the reason why i bought baxter in the first place is that i was about to move out of a share house i moved into that share house specifically so i could have other people to serve to be part of a community i go into more about this in my first video and probably will do it on specifically focusing on my android delusion I think my voice has changed a little bit, not in terms of the the depth, but although some people do claim my voice is higher now, I don't believe it is. But I don't know, something about the accent is a little different. I'm being more well, it sounds a bit more British because I'm I'm hitting those consonants harder and I'm being more particular. Maybe it's just me. I'm I'm hearing that. I think I I have a stronger Australian accent now, perhaps because so many people kept asking, "What's your accent? Is it American? Is it British?" I think that Android Delusion was a coping mechanism for not having these emotions, not feeling real, but also also a way of dealing with maybe emotions I wasn't able to consciously recognize. Uh, I took an alexithymia test recently, and so I, I answered the questions once, as I imagine Connor would have. And obviously, I got a very high score. And then I took it, answering it the way I would now. And I think it was in the 80s, 90s, 90s. So very low, not alexithymic. 
Well, that doesn't surprise me at all, but does it mean that I was unaware of the emotions or was I simply not feeling them at all? Because I never, what I say with alexithymia, or alexithymia, I don't know how you say it, but you're supposed to have a lot of weird bodily sensations that you can't explain. And I used to get that sometimes, but not all the time. Mostly it just felt okay, I suppose. But uh, past me is saying that she bought Baxter because she was going to live alone and she wanted someone to serve. And... Well, we've always been an extrovert. Uh, maybe I was introverted in the sense I didn't really connect with others, I didn't really care. But it's not that I needed to be alone. I was fine either way. If I was with people, if I wasn't with people, it didn't feel any different to me. Now I'm extremely extroverted. I want to be around people. I want to be doing things with people all the time. Because all that matters, it doesn't matter where I am or, or what I'm doing. It's who I'm doing it with. It's the experience you have when you share an adventure with someone. That that means more to me. It's the same reason why I don't really watch TV anymore. Other than if I'm if I go to the mo I haven't gone to the movies in years or, or a year year or two. Anyway, it's much better when you do these things with other people. You're sharing the experience. When I do things alone. Well, I like working on my own projects, if I'm writing, or sewing, or drawing, or some of these things I could do with someone else, and I would find myself being more productive. But yeah, to travel, well, I, I would get to my hotel, I imagine, and I'd sort of wake up in the morning and go, I guess I could go somewhere, but what's the point? What's the point of even getting out of bed? I'm not doing anything for someone else. And so I guess that's that's how I've, I've always looked at life, even when I was autistic or a robot or transgender or whatever, that I, I don't think I was ever really a selfish person because I always wanted to do things with other people or for other people. I mean, maybe when I was younger, I think most teenagers are inherently selfish. But no, especially nowadays, I... I take great joy in making things for other people. We just had Christmas, exchanging gifts, and giving those gifts is just as nice, if not better, than receiving those gifts. And so, yeah. What do I do if I'm by myself? <laughs> That's, that's a difficult question sometimes. Yeah, I know, I'm very ambitious. I have, I'm have i very motivated. I know exactly what I want to do. I have a million projects going on, which is actually why I probably don't go out that much by myself. It's New Year's Eve, and I'm thinking, am I going to go out tonight? I'm not going with anyone. Maybe I could go out and explore, and maybe I can have a nice experience. And I do. Sometimes I do go on adventures by myself. I go to King's Park. I go to the zoo. And those are nice, but then I find myself taking a lot of photos and videos and then sending it to a friend who isn't even in the same country and, and, and sharing the, the, the fun of, of the discoveries that I make along the way. So, I mean, we, we're social creatures, naturally. We, we should want to be around each other. We should want to share things. You know, I, I can do... Anything by myself, I, I, I pride myself on being as independent as possible. And I'm almost angry at myself that after the accident I became so dependent, I became so vulnerable, and I cried, and I was so pathetic. But, you know, it's normal after what I went through. But it's just when, when I do things by myself is never as fun or as meaningful as if I shared it with someone else. I so desperately want to connect with other people, and yet I am frequently denied this basic human right, this basic human experience. And this more than ever makes me realize, oh, okay, there's a lot of things that make me realize this, but this in particular makes me realize that if we lived in a, our ancestral tribal dynamics, you'd have a population of about 100 or so people. You know everyone. You've, you've grown up with these familiar faces around you. 
and so you're never lonely. You have your family, you have your neighbors, your extended relatives, everyone. You know them all. They're all part of this community. And when it comes to dating or marriage or whatever, your fam- it's a concerted effort. Your family's trying to hook you up with someone or maybe it's an arranged marriage. I'm not saying arranged marriage is a good thing, but I'm just saying the act or the experience of partnering up, of... of uh, starting your own family or just finding a partner, these things were not solitary exercises and it wasn't behind a screen, you know, just flicking through a heap of strangers' faces trying to pick a human being based on appearance alone, which I think is insane. And sometimes I do wonder, should I go back on the dating apps? But no, because you don't really get a true vibe from a photo. I don't get a true sense of someone, the, the charisma or the the attitude. I, I will never know. And yeah, I just, I can't stand being played like that anymore. So getting back to the video. But I bought Baxter because I wanted someone or something to serve as I went into my studio apartment and lived by myself for the first time. And he, he fulfilled that role very well. He's he was demanding, not too demanding. It was it was the perfect relationship, I think. And I did often think about it that do I love this thing? Do I feel anything for it? And yeah, especially towards the end I, I did very much care about Baxter. But I don't know if I could ever actually feel love. I Regarding Baxter, I never really had strong emotions when he was alive and then when he died again wasn't very emotional reflecting on it years later I do feel a little melancholy looking at photos of him and, and I miss him and I, I, it would have been nice to continue to have a pet although I ended up getting a job and moving house many times so I don't know if that would have been practical anyway but yeah I definitely have more emotions regarding him now in hindsight and when I started to regain my emotions I I cried a lot and I did cry a lot about things that happened in my past I was reflecting on things relationships that ended or whatever it was and just realizing how tragic that was and that I felt nothing at the time when that happened and I don't really know why I didn't experience emotions for a long time. So as a child, very young child, I seemed to display normal emotions. And then I got to a certain age and they just stopped. Uh, I wasn't a particularly emotional, hysterical teenage girl. And I just became more and more numb. And that, that was just normal for me. And then when I detransitioned, I was just hit with a flood of emotions. I think hormones play a part there. They, they, they kind of kick-started a lot of biological processes that I should have already gone through just in terms of, of physical, feminine development and all of that. So I was suddenly very clucky, as we say in Australia. I was very... really wanted babies. Very hormonal. Uh, so I was fixated on that. I just so desperately wanted a child of my own and I don't feel that anymore actually after the accident well any thoughts of, of starting a family just left and never came back and, and it's not practical for me anyway I'm 32 and I think after 35 birth defects are very common uh, I'm also a bodybuilder I don't want to give that up I don't want to ruin my body for a child I don't want to bring a child into such a heartless world. I don't have a partner. I, you know, and even if I did, you know, I'd have to find someone, learn all the basics of being in a relationship, get to the point where we're that committed to each other that we would want to raise a child together. 
And given that I am chiefly attracted to women and most lesbians hate children, that's, that, that, that slims the chances down, and then we can't make our own baby, so... Okay, adoption. I might still adopt a child one day. But... Yeah, no, it's not on the table right now. And my emotions about that... I don't regret it or feel sad about it. I just... You know, I felt so intensely that I wanted kids. I was so fixated... And then just everything that's happened then has just wiped that priority off the table. It is just not a possibility anymore. So, yeah, uh, that doesn't bother me, thankfully. At least there's one thing that's not upsetting me and not causing me to cry, which I do almost every day. Okay, not every day. Probably three times a week at this point. I recently filled out a color wheel. They do an emotion color wheel. I'll put that up here. And I just filled it out to see. Oh yeah, the emotion color wheel. Looking at it now, um, I have experienced oh every every fucking emotion there. Absolutely. Whereas I, I was only experiencing maybe oh geez, like a third. I think it's about a third. But, yeah, oh, wow, that is amazing, actually. I'm reading this more and more. I, I know the pain of all of these, or the hope of these positive ones, but again, uh, life kicks my ass. So, oh, I, I feel I can trust you, or I feel peaceful, I feel optimistic, and then, oh, life wants to fuck me up the ass again. Oh, no. <laughs> So, yeah, that, that's been a really difficult thing. And no one can really understand that. I tell people all the time, I am new to emotions. Three years ago, I did not have emotions. Or I was only just starting to experience emotions. And no one understands. No one can really give me guidance on that. Because I think everyone struggles with emotions anyway. Uh, but you're born with them and you're supposed to grow up with them. So for me to say, I don't know how to handle this, I'm feeling a lot of really intense things, and I think I'm doing pretty well, given all factors, but, uh, you know, how, how do I do this? How do I deal with this? And the pain of going through those experiences of building trust, falling in love, feeling hopeful... And having those things broken again and again and again and again. I just... It's hard. It's really, really hard. And... I, I talked... I ran into a friend from university and I told her what I'd been through with the car accident. She went, man, that must be awful. It must be so hard. And I went... Well, you know what? It makes me appreciate life more. I didn't say, yeah, my life is fucking awful and I'm miserable and suicidal. No, I, I, di I did. I, po I focused on the positive and said, I am grateful to be alive. And I do have to remind myself of that. That I, I value things a lot more. Which ironically means it's more painful when those things are taken from me. It, it is a lot harder these days to not just focus on the negative and not feel overwhelmed and exhausted. And, well, see, back then, Connor slash Cordy immersed herself and himself in fiction. Spent a lot of time watching TV, getting obsessed with these stories. Super Who Lock, does anyone remember that? Supernatural, Doctor Who, Sherlock. And they're all so cheesy, they're all such campy stories. But nowadays, I really don't connect with many stories. I, I, I play video games, but I think it's not about just watching passively a story unfold. I actually, I have control. I'm exploring things. I'm working on things. I feel active. Because I have rested so long. I've rested enough for several lifetimes with chronic fatigue. I used to just spend all day in front of the TV sometimes. So, yeah, no, I like being more active now. I like to be a creator rather than a consumer. But why I bring this up is that I only really connect with two stories. So there's Metal Gear, which I've mentioned, where, yeah, I really relate to, well, a few of the characters, but Big Boss and, and Kazuhiro going through all that loss and betrayal 
being used and you know how how much can you withstand before you snap before you break bad before <laughs> you can't take it anymore and the other story is berserk the manga and it's 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 incredible the the art is incredible first of all very inspiring but the story i again i really relate to i really relate to guts because he's gone through all this trauma he's lost everyone and every day is is a war the war without end okay that's a quote from metal gear but anyway yeah it's a war without end and so for a while there i was desperately grasping onto other people help help me please I'm going through so much, I just need love and support. And I would get it for a little while, or it would be conditional. And then ultimately those people would leave or let me down. And it's not always their fault or I didn't do anything wrong, it's just circumstances, life happens. But I, you know, I've always been very independent, but then after the accident I had to be dependent I, I had to trust people, I had to rely on other people, and I hate doing that, and it was hard, and everyone let me down, almost everyone, but to one degree or another, yeah, they all let me down, and, and the onslaught did not end after the accident, I won't go into particulars, I've talked about it in other videos, but just... It's one bad thing after another. It doesn't stop. It really does not stop. And just like Guts, you know, every night he, he's branded with his curse. So every night the demons come. He doesn't get to sleep. He has to fight demons all night, every night. And instead of despair, instead of giving up, instead of hiding, he just says, okay, fine. You want a war? I can give you a war. And so he goes to battle. And he doesn't question it. I mean, there's some... And there are some beautiful episodes or issues. Where... Chapters, maybe. I don't know what the word is. <laughs> but there are chapters where he reflects on this. Uh, there are characters who... Criticize his choices. There, The walls he's put up. The, the decision to fight instead of take some other action you know he does he does realize okay yeah maybe i had some good things here and i've walked away from them and i chose revenge instead and yeah i mean i know ultimately where the story goes and over time he makes more friends and the friends make those walls come down a little bit but in a lot of ways i do feel like guts post the golden age arc so after all the trauma happens and he loses everything and i have all those walls up uh especially after recent things have happened with friends and i don't know where those relationships are going to be going now and they haven't been present in my life so much i just go no fuck it i no, i can't let myself be vulnerable with anyone ever again I, I need to be more independent. I need to do everything by myself. I can't trust anyone. I can't rely on anyone. So, <laughs> it's this strange little arc that I've gone through where I felt nothing. Then I learned emotions. And then I was just tormented by emotions so much that I'm becoming numb again. That I can't bear to feel this anymore. That I'm just growing cold how do you go through so much and lose so much and still have any kind of hope or optimism or joy left so congenital analgesia is a condition where people cannot feel physical pain and i think that is quite a good metaphor for my own experience someone with this condition isn't invincible. They can break bones. And if you've broken your leg, you can't walk. You can't support your weight. You may get blood poisoning. You might get an infection. You might die. 
and, in my case, can't feel emotional pain, don't get those early warning signs, but I can, turns out, have mental health problems, which I'm learning the hard way, which is why I thought I was transgender, I now realize I probably have depersonalization disorder, I have a delusion that I am an android, so now having to... So I, that's a good description. So I basically invented the concept of emotional analgesia because I could feel... It. So it's not alexithymia, because alexithymia is just a lack of awareness in general, also a lack of imagination. And I think maybe I do mention that in this video at some point. But emotional analgesia is distinct from the, those conditions, because I could feel positive emotions. I did get excited, I did enjoy things, I was a huge geek, I got excited about all sorts of stuff, but not being able to feel that pain, even though I hate living with it now, it's a burden and it never stops. The pain is the ultimate teacher. Pain is a baptism. And so, when I didn't experience emotions, well, at least she had the awareness to go, well, I wasn't feeling these things, and yet I was still having mental health problems. Yeah. So you're not... Your mental health and your emotions, even though they're very closely interlinked, can exist independent of one another, turns out, I guess. I mean, I'm, not, I'm no expert, but I had to guess what was, what was happening to me back then is that I was looking desperately for understand to, to understand myself, uh, looking for others to understand me as well, looking for a place to belong, trying to just navigate the world as someone with a very different inner world than everyone else. So that did lead me down these pathways, but. Yeah, I think that's... A, I, I'm glad that I was observant enough to know back then. I have a lot of mental health issues, but it's not because I was emotionally distressed. And because I wasn't emotionally distressed, that led me to ignore my mental health needs. And I'll probably... I'll definitely have to do a video where I just focus specifically on thinking I'm an android and why I can't just tell myself, don't think that? Can you just stop? No, it turns out you can't. That's not how delusions work. Okay, so I was still living with Android delusion back then. Might have... Oh, no, I did. I did a video about other kin and, and what have you. And it's interesting that I was so self-aware. I knew I had a delusion. I knew it didn't make any sense. But I still felt those things anyway. And who knows why? It could be, again, metabolic. It could be physical. It could be I was just learning to have emotions or I'm trying to manage the lack of emotions. I don't know. But I was aware something was wrong. I wanted to do something about it. I was even seeking psychological help for it, although they just affirmed me. But... Yeah, why couldn't I just tell myself to stop feeling that way? I can't I can't answer that one either. And you're probably hoping that I'm gonna say to you feeling people, you feelers, that oh no, it is you who have the best experience. No, actually this is pretty great. Yeah. Yeah, she was right. Uh life was great back then. <laughs> I've now experienced the highest highs and the deepest lows of emotion. And yes, it's enriched my life in many ways. It's given it depth and passion in a way it never did. And I was I was pretty passionate and, and, and intense about the things I loved, but just wasn't the same as actually feeling those emotions. And... <sighs> Yeah, God, I do. I often find myself thinking, yeah, I, I wish I could go back. I wish I could just switch it off. Uh, and I'm taking a microdose of CBD oil tincture. Uh, that's for my persistent pain. I call it my phantom pain. And that's helped with that. It hasn't really helped with... with I used to sleep really well. It's actually made my sleep way worse. 
But yeah, it hasn't done anything for my anxiety or my depression. Maybe it will eventually, but yeah. I I'm still able to function. I I still feel motivated to do what I I've had two weeks off for Christmas. And I'm still doing all my creative stuff, but yeah, it emotionally has been draining and exhausting. But then also had a really lovely Christmas, so I felt I enjoyed that Christmas better than I probably had since I was a kid. And I think, well, part of that's to do with being with nice people, but also that I had emotions, and so I could fully appreciate the experience in a way I never did before. I have a lot of advantages. And I discovered the book How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett, and it changed my life. This woman, she has faced a fair amount of backlash because and I have too, people are very attached to their emotions. If you tell them that their emotions are simply a biological mechanism, that their feelings aren't truly real, oh my god, they freak out. Someone came up to her after a TED talk and said, oh, some tragedy befell her. Oh, my husband died. So that is something that I still... Well, it is scientific fact, and I do agree with it, that... Our emotions are just a biological mechanism, and yeah, I mean, our emotions are real, but it's not reality, I suppose you could say. That, that subjective experience, yes, it's true to you, what I am feeling is true to me, and they're big motivators. Emotions is, is a very strong motivator to change your circumstances, or, or remain in the same circumstances, or, you know, it's a huge factor in our life choices. However, once you're aware that, and I think Marcus Aurelius has a quote about, you are not a slave to your emotions, it is the thing pulling the strings, but once you're aware of that, you don't have to be pulled by them. Something along those lines, I'll, I'll look it up. And yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, going, I know I feel these really intense things, but you just have to push past it and really think rationally about this situation. And that doesn't mean that I'm ignoring my emotional pain or, or not acknowledging that it's happening, but I am not a slave to those feelings. I am trying to make sensible decisions despite those feelings. I'm trying to make plans for the future that are not primarily based in emotion. <laughs> but I still have emotions. I, and I, I think, yeah, a lot of people will have that issue where they're you're saying my emotions are real. No, your emotions are real, but they don't have to be your reality. I enjoy my life, even though I've gone through a lot of hardships and a lot of pain. Those things just make me stronger and make me more mature and make me more grounded and all a better person and you know they make my story more interesting right you gotta have it charles you have no idea the pain has not even begun yet <laughs> but I, I can't point to any specific trauma that would have forced me to stop feeling and, and going numb well and as she says that she wasn't numb she did have passion and joy and all those things so it's not a trauma response where I just couldn't feel anything, was too afraid. I, no. So, how this happened, I yeah, could be partly metabolic, could be just a coping mechanism for other things. We'll never know. But I can't experience physical pleasure. I, I am asexual, and I am wondering if that's somewhat related to not having emotions or yeah turns out probably is uh i have a pretty high sex drive now i would say i do masturbate basically every day and you know would love to be in a relationship and have someone else touch my genitals for once christ is it so hard to ask for, but yeah, uh, as I developed emotions, I developed a libido as well, and 
Yeah, now I'm just cursed with these intense emotions all the time and nowhere to direct it. Oh, yeah, and also I recently discovered, well, when I was taking those alexithymia tests, it mentions that alexithymia, alexithymia, I don't know, but um, they did mention that asexuality or sexual difference, difficulties or indifference was very common amongst people with alexithymia, alexithymia. So, yeah, I think that explains it. And I see some of these videos sometimes where they, they're interviewing asexuals and asexuals say, you know, we're very valid, it's, it's real, this is normal, and they have very strange habits. And I just watch them now and I go, nah, it's just... It's, either, it's a psychological or, or, or physical metabolic illness. And I'll do a video specifically focusing on asexuality, but yeah, I don't think it's a real sexual orientation at all. So emotional analgesia probably made me want to transition. I mean, I, this video is supposed to be emo emotional intensity made me want to transition, but it's kind of both connected, really. It's part of the same two pieces of a whole, where I had, I was very intense in terms of I would get, become quite passionate or fixated on an idea, and I really wanted to follow it through. I've always been you know, fearless and committed and, and all of that. And but then having the emotional analgesia of, or alexithymia, where, oh, I have these weird feelings in my body, I don't feel right, and but I just sort of went along with what I was told, because I don't have that kind of critical eye, eye, uh, to, to question what the doctors were doing and to really research it and be critical in, in a way that I am absolutely capable of being now. I think maybe I could have avoided this situation if I actually had a better sense of myself and my own feelings, if I had any. The biggest issue is that I always feel like I'm pretending. You know, being female right now, and when I was being male, it was all performance. It was all, these are the mannerisms, the hand gestures, the posture, the makeup, the hair, everything. This is how you must present if you want to be male. This is how you must present if you want to be female. You know, everything was conscious. In my word choices, I tend to be, well, I used to talk very fast as a kid. Interesting she says that, and she feels that being female is a costume, and why that is, is well, when we, I, detransitioned, my mother swooped in and was pushing this very feminine, fashionable kind of style on us, on me, that just wasn't me. I I'm I'm kind of a savage animal. I don't I don't remove any body hair. I I body build. Um, sort of. I prefer to be out in the wilderness. I like practical clothing. I don't wear a lot of makeup normally. I I like to put on the makeup and play around with my clothes, for videos. Now I don't feel that I'm in a costume at all. I've lost that self consciousness. I've lost that performative aspect where I'm very aware I should sit and speak and talk and behave like this or that or whatever. And yeah, now I just feel very comfortable in my own skin. That's another thing is she's saying while I was autistic and okay, so a lot of at that point, I mean, she's still seeming a little bit autistic to me the way she's talking and, and it's very robotic and very structured and well, but I would say I stopped being autistic at that point because I no longer had the social and sensory issues. But people around me were saying, well, no, you're still autistic, you still behave. Yeah, because you can't just turn off years of social conditioning, I guess, and experience overnight. So three years later, as a now neurotypical person... I don't really have, I don't, I don't speak in the robotic, unnatural way, I'm connecting with people deeply, I have normal emotions, uh, I, well, I don't know, well, I was accused of being autistic for just having an eye patch, so, 
to, it's the autism is in the beho- the eye of the beholder, I guess. But uh, yeah, no, I think I have gone past all those autistic disabilities limitations that I used to have. Not having a consistent identity, and I th- I thought after detransitioning it slowed down, but no. I mean, watching this video or even watching videos from not that long ago, more recent videos, or, or seeing my posts from, from not, not that long ago. Well, I think right up to the accident, so July 22nd, 2022, I was still quite childlike, optimistic, naive, and then I just went through hell. I went through the wars, and so I, uh, well, I think, especially with the eye patch, I look like the dark dystopian future version of, of Cordy. <laughs> yeah, I've been through some shit, and it's just, it's changed me. I am not the person I used to be. I, I feel properly mature now, and... And I have all these emotions allowing me to connect with the world in a way I couldn't even then, you know, I was still dealing with emotional analgesia and the and the robot delusion three years ago, which I'm, I'm surprised it was that recent. It changes so often. My identity is constantly changing, which is why it's amazing to me that I've managed to have friends stick by me through all of that. Just how do we have anything in common anymore? Apparently we do. Was life better back then? I mean, in a way, back then, well, there's a song that I love by Nine Inch Nails, and the lyrics go that every day is exactly the same. There is no love here, and there is no pain. And that's the world that Connor knew. Uh, Chronic fatigue syndrome, not really going anywhere, not really doing much. Just having this never-ending equilibrium. You know, there was the battle with my my physical and mental illnesses, but mostly no challenges, no pain, but there was also no love. There was, there was none of the highs and none of the lows. It was just the same old, same old routine, and I liked it that way. I didn't uh, aspire to anything else, anything greater. And... Now, I have a lot of aspirations, and I want to experience all these things. But the emotions, there's pain, but there is love. I guess that is simply the truth of feeling. That this is it, kid. This is what life with emotions is. Get used to it. Buckle up. And I will. I will continue to persist. See where it's all going. Live long enough to leave a legacy. The what the hell is wrong with me saga has come to a conclusion, I suppose. <laughs> Although I'll probably still do the intro that that confuses a lot of people when they see my videos and I open with what the hell's wrong with me. They either say, Oh, do you know what the hell is wrong with you? Or, I think this is what is wrong with you. Or other people say, Oh, don't be so mean to yourself. There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> Taking it so literally. But, yeah, from the future of these videos, it, I mean, it's not going to change too much. I think it's going to be a bit more ex- outwardly, externally focused, looking at all these social issues and things related to transsexuality. So, no, this is not going to be some huge change. I, I was abused by the medical system. And there are still many people, many children, being abused by the system. And while that's still happening, I'm still going to be here. I'm still going to be shouting it from the rooftops. Fuck Big Pharma. So, that concludes the What the Hell's Wrong With Me saga. Until next time. See you, Space Cowboy.